Robinson in Long Beach. So we're going to wait a couple minutes. I guess we'll go ahead and get started for our special meeting uh, for the Planning Commission. If we could get the roll call, please. Yes. Sorry. <coughs> Commissioner Ruth. It's not here. <laughs> Commissioner Newman. Here. Commissioner Christensen. Here. Commissioner Wilk. Here. And Chair Welch. Here. Thanks. Now we'll do the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, well, welcome. Um, I think our fellow commissioner will be showing up soon, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we'll start off with any oral communications. Oh, I'm sorry, I should read the. Uh, do we have our little information sheet on? Here's what I can tell you. This is a. <laughs> I don't. Televised or something. Does she? I don't have that. It's no. okay. So Sorry, is it being that. aired tonight? Is do we have a? It is, and it is um, Lynn Duncan, I believe. Is oh, his name. That's okay. So uh, normally our planning commission meetings are being televised on. A number of channels <laughs> I don't remember off the top of my head um, 
and then it is also, you can go and review and view it on uh, our website at www.cfcapitola.com and, oh, .org, is that right? Thank you. I need all the help I can right now because I'm ad-libbing, but, um, and then if you uh, would just please silence your pagers and our phones, then that would be appreciated. And um, I think we're good with that. We'll, uh, any additions or deletions to the agenda? Um, we did receive one public comment that came in this afternoon regarding item 3A from Swenson. Okay, we, we, I think all the commissioners have a copy of that. Great, thank you. Um, and I should also mention, I, I printed off a map of parcels in the R1 for you regarding, there was previous public comment that was attached to the staff report Okay. But I thought in, in this discussion it would be helpful to break down the lot sizes within the R1 so you'd know how many different lot sizes fall under different size categories. So okay. we also received a map. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So I guess we could note that uh, Commissioner <coughs> uh, McRuth has shown up. So yeah, sorry. That's Ten minutes right. from the Joe yeah. box to get here. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. Welcome to Capitola. <laughs> Um, this part of our uh, meeting is for public comments for those items that are not on tonight's agenda. So if you would like to speak to the Planning Commission about something that's not on tonight's com um, agenda, this is your time to get up and speak. No? Okay. Then we'll move on to uh, Commission comments. Any no comments from our Commissioners? How about staff comments? No comments. Okay, tonight's uh, public hearing is an update on our uh, zoning code. This is a special meeting to look at uh, the implementation along with the local coastal plan. And there's a number of items we're going to discuss tonight, but one of those items um, is, uh, I guess, uh, I, what are we, what are we calling this? A, a presentation by Mr. Sam Shoyan. So I will start off with you, and uh, if you want to come up and give us your presentation, I'd appreciate it. And Peter, if you could just speak into that microphone for us, we'd appreciate it so that it's recorded on the TV. Is that working? Okay. There you go. So I have a house up in the jewel box on Prospect, and I've had that since 2004, lived in the area since 83, and we want to remodel it and move here and retire in preferably a, a year and a half time. Not sure if we'll make that. But anyway, so I've been really digging into the code, looking at everything and looking at what I can build. and and found one thing that um, just seemed kind of odd was this uh, this issue of exclusion for a garage space okay and so if you go to the next the, the next chart so the code the old code is that line across the bottom I, I, I think you guys are probably familiar with this but in the new code there is an exclusion for lots less than 3,000 square feet in size of 250 square feet of garage space and it, it excludes that from the total square footage or allowable square footage. So you end up with this kind of jagged line of what you're allowed to build in terms of square footage versus your lot size. So my lot is 3,200 square foot. And if you look at that, if you have a 3,000 square foot lot, you can build a, a larger house. So that's what started me down this path. But really I started looking at it thinking, I need to build a bigger garage than what the minimum is allowed, but I have to sacrifice um, floor space in the house. My wife insists on having a garage, and she insists on having a large enough garage where she can open both doors and things like that. So um, I, I have to do that. And so as we looked at things, um, I started thinking of how could I address this, this thing. My first idea was why don't you just let us design to the 3,000 square foot rules so if i have a 3200 3200 square foot lot i just design a house as if it were 3000 square feet and make that a level line from 3000 square feet up to 3500 square feet and i think the you know the drawback of this is is that it does increase the sizes of all the houses in the city you know and so i i was thinking through that and trying to think of a compromise and my next idea was this next chart which actually there's a kind of a, a precedent in the previous code 
for detached garages where it allows 100 square feet of ancillary space to be excluded from the total square footage calculation. And I thought, okay, there's, there's something I can work with. What I would propose here, it's kind of a compromise between both plans, is to allow 125 square feet of ancillary space in a garage above the 200 square foot minimum for every lot size. And that green line would kind of become the new norm. That, that added space between the, the old code and the green line is only additional space in the garage. And this thing really, really started uh, getting traction with me because when I look around my neighborhood and most of the neighborhoods up around here, the streets are just full of cars and nobody has their cars in their garage. And garages are pretty much, you know, filled with bikes and things like that. And that's the genesis of this whole thing when I was debating with my wife what kind of house we could build. She said, where are you going to put your bicycles? Uh, I need, you know, I want my garage just for myself. You've got to build yourself a garage and things like that. And uh, so that's what came of this. I think if we had a little bit larger garages, then people would park their cars or more likely to park their cars in the garage. As it is now, nobody... It's pretty rare to see people using their garages up here, especially in that jewel box area. I'm not sure about the rest of town, but I'd imagine it's probably the same in Riverview and things. So that's the gist of my, uh, my proposal before the, the new code is fully adopted to consider that modification, allowing for some ancillary garage space and create more uh, parkable garages. Great. That's it. Well, if you don't mind hanging on, maybe we'll see if any commissioners have any questions for you before you. I'm just wondering how you would guarantee people are going to use the garage even though they get that extra space. Well, I would go door to door. On that. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no guarantees. And, you know, I mean, the, you can't guarantee anything. You can only try to uh, motivate people. And I know one thing is that with a 10 by 20 foot space, you can only open one side of doors in a garage that size and and you know it's part of the the debate I'm having with my wife as to what do we need a larger garage or a bedroom the kids can come to visit us in and things like that and so she's choosing the garage <laughs> um, wow but so there's no <laughs> yeah it's pretty harsh she's saying hey they can sleep on the couch um, <clears throat> but but yeah there's no guarantee but I just think it's the right thing to do I think 10 by 20 garages. I don't know if anybody who's, who's got a single car garage. You know, 10 by 20. I mean, do you always park your car in it? Yeah. I mean, that's just it. You know. So, our whole the whole thing. We have these strict parking codes. You got to have two parking spots, things like that. But really, with a, the way things are written, we we functionally only use the outdoor parking spot. So, yeah, let's try to address it. So could you explain to me again why you, you uh, chose the second option as opposed to the first? The first option at least oh, gets the rid first of this. One? Yeah, I would love to have the first option. It would allow me to build a bigger structure. But I was concerned, and actually after discussion with staff and things, concerned whether it's not pushing the envelope too far and building bigger houses across the boards. You know, See, because the whole thing is this, that the, the map that was provided, I, I don't have it, it's of the lots, I think maybe less than 25% of the lots in town are under 3,000 square feet. So that larger, larger space exclusion would only apply to kind of a minority of the lots in town. Okay. So if we do my second proposal, which takes that a flat line going up, I think it captures a much greater percentage of the homes or the lots in town makes uh, many, many more lots eligible for larger homes you know, or larger garages. I would certainly love to have you uh, adopt that. I think it would be, yeah, I think that would be a great solution. But I'm offering this as a, as kind of a compromise if, if you have concerns about home sizes in town. Keep up, please you consider both. Well. Um, well, we're not gonna take action on it tonight, but if you want more discussion, I'm. I mean, I'll just comment that, uh, and I, I've kind of studied your uh, presentation, the written presentation. I think you've uh, uncovered a, a, a serious discrepancy in our um, code with the 
foot exclusion for uh, for lots under 3,000 feet. That really doesn't make any sense, and I agree with you because it it all boils down to floor area ratio. <coughs> if you want smaller lots to um, be able to build more, then you just have a larger floor area ratio instead of having the 250 foot garage exclusion. I don't know how that um, how we ended up with that, but it is an oddity, and I agree with that. Some uh, at some point, I think we should clean up our floor area ratio uh, portion of our code to eliminate that and just decide how much uh, building we want to be allowed on smaller lots. Maybe it's a higher percentage. But, I don't know. But my point here is that I'm not asking for a larger structure. I'm <coughs> asking for to build a bigger garage that doesn't take away. Well, you can build a bigger solution. garage. You could build like a 200 yes. foot house and a. Yeah. Ah, I understand. I understand. <laughs> and the rest garage. <laughs> so, but I, I'm, <laughs> not, I'm not advocating building a bigger home, but only having a 20 by 10 foot garage. I'm advocating, if you want to go above the, the uh, buildable space, you can only add garage. If you want to go beyond that. Okay. That's, well, that's to me, it idea. just comes down to floor area ratio, which I think uh, bears some rethinking or tinkering uh, down the road for us. But thank you for bringing okay. that up. And thank else? you, Peter. So, so yeah, I did have a question because <coughs> when when I saw that chart, um, I can see where we had the the existing line, which kind of makes sense, I guess. But then, uh, then at some point, a planning commissioner or city council decided to put this step in it, and I was wondering if anybody remembers where how that how that came and why yeah. that square footage was picked. Because when I talked to Katie about this, I thought that was like okay, that was. A clear-cut, you know, this lot size as a po but looking at this chart, it's pretty much a continuous. So this was done in our recent code update. So it was one of the um, when we went through floor area ratio, there was the I, I had brought forth um, some changes for decreasing the side yard setbacks on the second story for really narrow lots and then out of those conversations it also turned into well maybe we in our floor area we should also be thinking so we we typically have this wedding cake factor for homes that happens on the second story because there's a greater setback second story setback standard so on really narrow lots when we were thinking of the riverview area across from city hall here where there's really narrow lots and they're very small um, to allow them to build within setbacks. And from those discussions, I think that's how we also added mm -hmm. an allowance for garages on these really, because thinking about the small lots, it was a suggestion, I think, of one of the planning commissioners. And um, that was built in for that reason. But it is interesting, our typical lot size in Capitola, I think starts at 3,200 square feet, a 40 by 80 lot, and goes up. So when Mr. Shamshoian came to me with this this item, I, from from my perspective on that, um, the exception that we created, it would almost seem like taking his approach of this line and bringing it back would start from the 3,200 square foot lot and bringing the line back this way. If because these are really the l smaller lots in town, it's anything under 3,200 square feet is kind of. Not you sure it was the planning commission that so. came up with that, not the city oh, it council? Oh, it, it may have been the city council. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. I, I don't, don't remember, remember that. that. I don't remember. No. Yeah. Well, maybe it was the city council. fellow commissioners in the audience doesn't remember. He so. doesn't remember. I don't think we did it. <laughs> yeah, I don't recall. <laughs> anyway, after, after but, looking at all these things and thinking this all through, I kind of came back to the garage issue. I, I think 10 by 20 garages is what people are kind of forced into doing because that's the minimum you must build and they aren't that usable and nobody uses them. So we aren't solving the parking problem. Very good point taken and uh, we appreciate your presentation. If there's no more Can questions. We, I just wanted to get a clarification on what Ed said. But if, if we use just go by floor area ratio, mm -hmm. that kind of leaves it up to the designer to do right. yeah. whatever he wants, right? Or she wants. Can we kick this back to the staff and say, give us a presentation on the, maybe where this came from and give us some options? Fix it. Fix it, yeah. <laughs> fix it. <laughs> give us some options to fix it. Well, it'd be interesting to see where, because I, I don't recall us talking about it, but I don't know if it was a city council thing or. I think it had to come out of the city council review. Oh, sorry. Okay. But 
Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, here's the table for floor area ratio. So the way in which floor area ratio is set up is the smaller the lot, the greater the floor area ratio size. So for a home that is for on these on a lot less than you know 32 51 that's when you've got the floor area ratio of 57 or 58 if it's below 2650 so it is set up that way the smaller the lot the larger the far right i think it's pretty gradual it mm -hmm. could be uh, a little bit more dramatic the, the uh, increase for the smaller lots which would that would be a better more consistent way of doing what the 250 but garage exclusion was, I guess, intended to do. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Champlain. All right, thanks. Okay, we'll move on with the uh, zoning uh, discussion. And this uh, is going to be probably more than one meeting, I'm guessing, by looking at the book. So I think what we discuss is maybe going through the discussion points and having staff go through the discussion points, and then from there we can talk about other items <coughs> and uh, Katie maybe you can just explain the, the process of you know reviewing with the Coastal Commission and and how we got to the point where we're at tonight yep. yep so I have a few slides for you that okay. we'll, I'll go over first I want to take time to introduce Kevin Kahn Kevin Kahn is um, the Central Coast District Supervisor he's located in Santa Cruz um, we met on a regular basis throughout the summer months and um, Kevin and Rainy Graven who was unable to make it here this evening is uh, their uh, analyst, staff analyst, worked very closely with the two of them and they circulated our, our zoning code update to between five different staff members I believe and at all different levels so that there was quite a thorough review that took place in the edits that you see this evening. And Kevin's here to help us out because there's definitely, I, I had, um, I learned so much during those meetings with the Coastal Commission of why they were asking for certain things and where it stems from in the Coastal Act. So hopefully tonight as we go through these will be, uh, anytime Kevin you want to jump in, just you can provide clarity to us and help educate the Planning Commission as well because it was extremely helpful for me. So was this just a compilation of the five staff members comments or was it then reviewed and edited and one common agreed upon set was submitted? So it was um, edits from five different staff members but then we sat down and went through all of the their edits and kind of agreed upon their edits at a certain point of what you're seeing so that that was some back and forth with staff and then I further took those and there are some that I didn't think um, should be adopted at this stage and what we can get into some of those are the topics of discussion tonight but most of them were agreed upon edits that we 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 talked about each edit in this right in, in this draft and I'll, I'll just it, it um, we just wanted to make sure that we were giving edits uh, to you know the the best possible edits that were it wasn't just reflecting my edits or Rainey's edits or one person but it went through our legal team and just to make sure that there weren't any new surprises uh, later in the process so um, we think we've you know done as try to give as thorough a job as possible about going through our internal review steps great thanks welcome Kevin and and also we are not going to in the next tonight or our next meeting to discuss the geological or non-conforming is that right that's right and I'll get into that okay. with this overview so I just high level uh, the local coastal program is um, a mixture is a combination of things we adopted a local coastal program which includes our land use program our land use plan I'm sorry I wrote that wrong in there <laughs> land use plan and that was included in your binder at the very end and the land use plan is really a long-term policy document it it ties the Coastal Act to local long-range planning for the city of Capitola, and it has many of the policies and implementations that should occur, very much like our general plan, but really um, focused on the coastal area and tied to the Coastal Act. And then there's also the implementation plan, which is made up of our zoning code. It's sections of the zoning code. It's not actually all of the zoning code, and it also includes portions of the municipal code, such as our floodplain, um, area and then 
the land use map. So that would be our general plan land use map as well as our zoning map. Um, the focus of the work we've been working on recently that's under, that will be under review by the Coastal Commission is the local coastal program implementation plan, which is our, the zoning chapters, our, our zoning map, and we'll also be bringing them the general plan land use map. Um, so back in January 25th of last year, we adopted our new zoning code and a new zoning map. So you see this very nice new map that um, <coughs> since, since the adoption of the code, the new code has taken effect in areas outside the Coastal Commission. So the first thing we ask when someone comes to our counter is, where's your pro project located? And then we know um, if it's outside of the Coastal Commission, we, we bring out the new code and our old 1975 edition zoning code is still applicable inside the Coastal Commission. So the process we're going through right now is towards getting a um, certification of our zoning code so that we can go back to that one nice clean map for all of Capitola. Um, within the zoning code, part, all of parts one, two, and three are included in the um, LCPIP implementation plan. Parts four, there's sections of parts four that are included, and then all of part five, the glossary. Um, at this stage, we have a document that's about 90, 95% complete for with all Coastal Commission edits. What it's lacking is, um, well, we've done the work for chapter 17.68, geological hazards, and chapter 17.92 for non-conforming. Uh, geological hazards at the time of submitting that to Coastal Commission, the rather than giving us red lines, they're working on a, a policy document that's still in draft form at the Coastal Commission. And they had advised that we look at Marin County's um, recent update to their geological hazard section, but there were no red lines provided on that chapter. And for chapter 17.92, I got those more recently after we went through the majority of the edits. And because of the density of Capitola so close to the ocean, um, the standard non-conforming that they would like to see, that they typically have people adopt, or maybe it's a new, new standard, it would be uh, have far-reaching impacts on areas like Cliffwood Heights, areas really far away from the coastal zone. And for us to go through that, I think there's a lot more um, public outreach that needs to be done prior to working towards adoption of the non-conforming. So for now, we've got our 80% standard that would stay in place. Um, as we're working through in the next year, we're updating our local hazard mitigation plan that talks about geological hazards and any, um, we'll, after that process is done, I would plan to start the process of updating the geological hazards and non-conforming coming back to the Planning Commission, getting red lines from coastal staff and working together through this process to bring those two chapters back to Planning Commission. So that is one thing that um, I would like to hear from the Planning Commission before we go too far into this is, um, is there support for bringing forth a 90%, 95% document would you prefer that we start that process now of working on geological hazards and non-conforming? Um, or that I'd love to have some conversation on that before we proceed. Yeah, maybe we can just do a consensus and see what our fellow commissioners here think about um, putting off the geological and non-conforming and, and adopting what we can adopt now, maybe in an easier format than jump into a, a debate through everything. Kevin, I don't, do you want to add to this? I'll, you know, yeah. you know and Kevin, maybe you <coughs> could just do this for me. Just maybe explain, if you can, a little bit how the Coastal Commission uh, and statute, how, where your authority comes from, and then how you get to a point where um, it's gone beyond the tidal area into deep into our city and, and how that part works. Sure. So the our authority derives from the California Coastal Act of 1976, and um, you know, it was in, created in response to the Coastal Zone Conservation Act, which is Proposition 20 in 1972. And it, it established a series of, of policies. So it did a couple of things. First, it defined where the coastal zone is in the state. 
and it's specifically mapped um, by it was mapped by the legislature and so um, and so those maps of where the coastal zone boundary is including for Capitola is is, is dictated by statute so that's um, how the the authority is of, of what the coastal zone is, is derives from and then within the so the development within the coastal zone needs to be consistent with the uh, coastal resource Pol coastal resource policy specified in the Coastal Act. And there's a series of policies addressing things like um, protection of sensitive habitats, public recreation, access to the coast, um, armoring and, and shoreline protective devices, um, and a visual resources, and a series of other statutes that, that said this is how development, which is broadly defined in the Coastal Act, is to be carried out. Um, the ultimate, one of the ultimate goals of the Coastal Act, or, or um, the way it's set up, is a state-local partnership. So it is, the intent is that the, it's the state's broad policies about how development is to be carried out in the coastal zone. Uh, and then it's to be implemented by local governments, largely by local governments, by setting up what's called local coastal programs, as uh, Katie mentioned. And LCPs are the tools by which local governments implement the Coastal Act in, in their city. And some mandates of the Coastal Act are very specific. For example, it's, the Coastal Act is very specific about what can and cannot take place in a wetland, for example. That's the, the statute's pretty clear on that. Other things are more um, uh, suitable or, or are more, there's a lot of discretion that could be tailored to local government needs, like things like protection of visual resources, for example, or community character. And so it's the intent through LCPs, a land use plan and implementation plan, to uh, take the statewide mandates, statewide statutes, and implement those in the, the individual LCPs and how, how to address that uh, in the city. And then once the Coastal Commission reviews and approves those LCPs, most permits, then coastal development permits, are delegated to the, the city, the local government, to carry out. And Capitola's LCP was first adopted in 1990. And so um, this is one of the first kind of comprehensive, there's been amendments um, since then, but this is one of the first kind of comprehensive updates to a portion of it. Um, and so, We've been working um, pretty closely with the city staff, um, with a good collaborative relationship on uh, making sure that the, the zoning, uh, zoning code and some of its provisions helps implement both the land use plan and the, the Coastal Act. And so that's probably more than you wanted to hear, but that's a general gist of, of where we're at and what our role is uh, in this process. Very good, thank you, Kevin. Um, so Katie, where do we, do we wanna have this discussion about, do we wanna, Try to move forward so with what we have or the two uh chapters that we're not ready on seem to me to be fairly important in terms of the coastal plan as opposed to some of the other things that we have proposed changes on that i have trouble seeing how they relate to the coastal act frankly some of the changes but those two seem like they could really affect uh, coastal resources those two issues and uh any, any other just mick you good no do you have any discussion about that? Well, so she's asking whether or not we should adopt this piecemeal, chapter by chapter, basically, as opposed to wait and approve it all in, w in one bit or one big bite. And uh, I would assume that eating an elephant one bite at a time is, is, is easier. So I would right. propose we adopt what we can, especially while we have the Coastal Commission here. Very good. And I would hope, Courtney, you have something you want to add? Yeah. I was agreeing, but. To, to break it up into two. Reasons. Okay, very good. Um, and uh, Katie, I, what do you think about, because I think the other two items um, also are gonna be a little, have a little more discussion, if we will, and maybe needs input more from our community because I think there's some pretty big impacts. And um, by putting this, those other two items until later, is it possible to notice the areas that are affected uh, along the riparian areas along the coast so the homeowners have a chance to have some input in that process definitely yeah we can do um, uh, more noticing than typical when you've got uh, far-reaching changes you can put a notice in the 
paper because it affects more than a thousand okay. homes. But in this situation with special circumstances of looking at if you want to do a hundred foot buffer from the bluff right. and if you want to do a hundred foot buffer from the, um, the SoCal Creek, we can definitely do that and make it a very specific. I think there'd be, um, even before public hearings, we would do similar to what we're, uh, just some public outreach, kind of more informal, hear from the residents, what do they think is a good approach when you're on a bluff and is it retreat or is it, you know, there's different philosophies there that I think we really need to get into those conversations with our residents before moving right. forward. So. And I know we had an ad hoc committee on the bluff area and some of those others that, that want to, may want to be involved in that. So I, I think the items that we're looking at tonight are areas that we can come to some mutual ground and, and it's not going to be that big of an impact. But those other ones I think would be nice to have as much outreach to our public as we can. Because it's, it's a pretty big hit for our, our community. We're such a small, small area. Very good. So with that... And with I'm, Well, I think I think as we go through it, thanks for bringing that up. I think we we should have some public comment tonight. I think as we go through the discussions, we could um, and to just to be fair, I think what it, uh, the staff has outlined is some discussion points within this, and there's many many items with the, within each chapter. But I think just to start off, we can go through those discussion points and maybe at each discussion point bring in uh, public comment. <laughs> I'd be happy. You want to come up and make a comment? Let's open this to public comments. <laughs> See, hey, we're not opposed to taking uh, insight, especially from experienced individuals. So, um, so you're considering adopting part of the new zoning ordinance and leaving part of the old zoning ordinance in place. And when we originally started this process, the reason you were doing a new zoning ordinance was because you wanted to make things easier for the community under, to understand and um, easier for projects to be done. And it seems to me that you're choosing the worst path because now you're going to have part of the new zoning ordinance in the coastal zone part of the old ordinance in the coastal zone and in the other part of Capitola you're going to have the whole new zoning ordinance so now you're going to have three documents that people are going to have to go through and figure out how their project is going to work uh, I also think there is a certain danger in saving what are the two toughest sections of the zoning ordinance till the very end because you may reach a point where the Coastal Commission says, look, we're not going to approve anything else in Capitola till you bring those two in and get that part of your zoning ordinance certified uh, as part of your LCP. So I think you need to have a little bit of a community discussion about do you, want, do you really want to go through and just adopt part of the ordinance or do you want to you know, tackle the tough things um, all together? So um, I, I would say uh, think hard about just adopting part of the ordinance because it could come back to bite the city. Thanks, Susan. I appreciate your insight. So can I follow up on that with staff? Yes. Because uh, I assume that these chapters uh, pretty much stand alone, and maybe that's incorrect. But if there's chapters that ref refer to back and forth to each other, I can see the public comment uh, being valid. But if it's, it's like, okay, you know, section 17A through X or whatever, we're going to adopt in this area, that area, um, can, can, you, can you piece it up or does, sure. does it really get confusing? Um, so what would have happened is in the coastal zone, the old chapters for geological hazard and the old chapter for nonconforming would still apply. And we would, you can, um, so that, that would be confusing and what we, uh, that would be the confusion. So whenever someone has a non-conforming or they're located on the bluff, 
we go back to the old standard. Actually, it would only be the non-conforming geological hazards. We have no edits, and it reflects exactly what the old code was. So it would really be the non-conforming. So a non-conforming in the area outside of coastal would be treated differently than a non-conforming inside coastal. To clean that up, if you wanted, we could bring back the old non-conforming chapter at this point, and keep, or you know, if you want both to be in sync and not have anything, have any discrepancies between the two. Um, but there would be a difference in non-conforming. The new standards would apply outside the coastal zone and the old standard would. That's the way it is right now. Right now it's worse because right now we've got the entire new code working outside the coastal commission and the old code working outside the coastal zone and the what? old code inside. I don't see so. that because right now we've got the entire new code applicable mm -hmm. outside the coastal commission, co coastal area. And now we're going to start applying part of the new code, almost all of it, to the coastal zone, and that'll right. you know sort of it'll reduce the discrepancy, in my view. Yeah, and I, well, my question, I, I just wondered if there was any uh, conflict. In other words, you 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 go to the new section here, uh, and in one section, chapter whatever, and it then you, you find a conflict or a contradiction because we didn't adopt it didn't adopt a new section no so right now um, are the contradictions there aren't with the geological hazards it's really a, a chapter that relates to specific areas within with an overlay so yes, there so are it, it stands alone and non-conforming stands alone so what kind of time so. frame are we talking for the whole package to be finally adopted you know from I, I'll actually ask Kevin to answer the part of the Coastal Commission behalf but, but after Planning Commission makes a recommendation to City Council and City Council adopts it it would then go to Coastal Commission and do you mean for the rest of the zoning yeah, code or for, for the for everything for everything uh, it, it de for everything it depends on kind of the city's process with respect to you know notice and hearings on the the hazards update and and the reason why we're um, it, it's entirely your decision but the reason we're okay with separating the two out is because of the fact that these are really tricky issues um, and does warrant a, a good robust public process um, dealing with contentious issues like what can and cannot be armored and and those type of issues so um, I, I I'm sorry, I can't really ask, answer that question. It's it's a that's a tough one. I, I if we move forward with just the rest of the zoning code, I think you know because we've been doing really good coordination. I think we're pretty close. Um, I think that's something that we could bring to hearing in the relative near term, um, definitely this year. Um, the re rest of it, it just kind of depends on the the city's process. On well, let me matters. ask Katie then what. If the process were to adopt the whole thing at once and move it onto the Coastal Commission, what are we looking at? So months, years? Oh no. Um, so from the time that Coastal Commission, so if we did this two-step process, um, I would hope that we would have this adopted by Coastal Commission this summer. Would that seem reasonable? Um, and then from there, I think our LHMP is going to be completed by the end of the summer, and then we would have the staff capacity to jump back into this. So have a public hear have public outreach, then start the hearing process. Um, so once so we've another once the city has completed their tasks of adopting a completed version of the zoning code, does it have to be approved by the Coastal Commission before? the old part and the new part are applied separately still? Or when we adopt it fully, do we apply the new one? Once it's, so if the Coastal Commission, and that you've, they've said that they would um, certify the first part separately, correct? Right. The right. Certify it separately. Um, so then that would take effect at the time that that's certified. And I would hope that that would be this summer, because it's to get to this point we've done quite a bit of work on the staff level of okay. reassurance and then after the summer I think we'd start working on the second part of geological hazards and non-conforming 
And, and outside the coastal area, they've already adopted the new zoning code. So we're already. And Kevin, I like those words that you said about it's totally your discretion. You keep up with that and we'll have a good night. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, I think another part of this is um, by doing it in part is it, it does build a relationship. Quite frankly, I, I don't have a lot of trust for the Coastal Commission and a lot of faith. So I'll just say that up front. I, I, you're a nice person and I, I think this gives us an opportunity to work through some easy things. But um, I, I have some heart uh, burn over where we're going in, in the future. So. Um, with that, do we want to move forward and I just do some more public input? Oh, in okay. Come on up, sir. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, Jesse Bristow from Swenson. Um, I was going to comment on something else, but since this was brought up, um, the benefit of doing the two step process is the current area that isn't up to date as part of the zoning. You have a lot of projects potentially on a holding pattern with the old standard so if you move forward with that 80 percent plan you you have that standard that's approved by the coastal it's it's an incentive for a little more economic development from a developer standpoint and city as well so. and jesse i'm glad you because i i totally it went over my head and i forgot to do this we were going to ask those people from the public so we could take care of your items first and i think you're here because of the uh I think it was on our discussion number 10. Is that right, Katie? That's correct. So if if we can start, and is there anyone else from the public that has an item here specifically they want to talk about tonight? There were still some people want to talk about the last point we were on. They can comment. I can come back. Yeah, we'll have you come back after we do that. Thank you. Um, and, and we have the Blodgetts here for topic one. Oh, okay, COVID. very good. Okay. As I said earlier, I'm trying to retire here and remodel the home. So I'm, I'm the <laughs> example that, that he's referring to as a development, and I am in a holding pattern. And I look at the new code as a 95% you know, improvement over the old code, and there's just a couple of sections which need to be uh, you know, negotiated. That could take quite some time. So I'm really in favor of doing, doing a, an approval of what's been agreed upon between coastal and, and the city and my my real question since I'm on a I'm trying to retire is why does it take till summer <laughs> I think all, everything outside of those two sections is aligned between coastal and and city staff so is that not the case it, it, so the summer is an estimate of time as soon as we um, have this the modifications agreed upon to a certain level and uh, uh, the marching orders from city council for accepting the changes then we'll submit it to the coastal commission these things it does take time in order for them to review a whole zone and they, they've done the work but okay. they haven't brought it to their to the coastal commission yet this is all work that's been done at the staff level okay. so it's similar to what we're going through with our uh, planning commissioners tonight but they've all seen this uh, many times which it'll be all new to their coastal commission so we estimate it'll be it's optimistic for the summer all right okay thanks. I had a question oh sorry sure <laughs> don't go right ahead yes <laughs> I was just wondering if the um, like Susan was saying if if at the end of it if there's any chance that the coastal commission might shoot down our potential to to modify those last two sections at a, at a later point yes uh, I mean I I'm not gonna um, uh, I'm not gonna like I said these are um, very difficult issues issues frankly that we're still grappling with as uh, coastal staff and coastal commissioners um, you know dealing with things like sea level rise and and uncertain complicated things so um, I would hope that we can craft something working with the city and, and the residents and and craft something that we're all mutually agreeable but I I, I want to you know to make it clear I, I don't know if it's not a it's not a certainty we'll just put it at that but we'll do obviously we'll do our professional best since we may not have a consensus do you want to see if we want to proceed by motion to adopt the procedure that's been suggested yeah I do we do we have a consensus how many people are in favor of 
uh, adopting it as a piecemeal as opposed to waiting. No, just take a. I don't have a problem as long as we s the time frame is realistic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we've been. S I think we've been going since 2010. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that when we started the general plan update? That's about right. Yes. <laughs> so I think, okay. and I I apologize for appearing to be disorganized up here. Oh, I am a little disorganized, but I, so I think what we'll do because I know we have the plodgets here, and that is uh, relative to uh, our dis discussion number one. So. Maybe Katie, we can start with discussion number one, and then we'll jump to ten and get uh, Jesse up here with their. Sure. Concerns. And then one other thing I want to clarify is that if there are other items that you would like to discuss, I believe that we will be continuing this to our next hearing. So at the end of the meeting, I'd love to hear any additional items you'd like me to bring forth at the next meeting, unless we're we finish this all tonight. And also, if um, the public has items that they want to discuss other than the ten topics, we can open that up at the end of the meeting as well. Is okay, and maybe, because um, I have a, I have a lot of things in here, I don't know, I see a few yellow tabs on some of the others, so maybe after, because I'm pretty confident we're not gonna finish tonight, so maybe we can email, kind of like we did on the original That'd plan, those concerns, so we can maybe capsulize those in our next meeting. Okay. And so the way the, this will work is um, we'll have Katie staff do a little presentation on the discussion and then we'll open it up for public comment and then after you've had a chance to comment we'll close the public comment period and bring it back for our discussion. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, Thanks, okay so the first item is Monarch Cove Inn. Um, the previous zoning for Monarch Cove Inn was visitor serving zone and during the zoning code update we took the visitors serving zone and we made it a visitor serving overlay, which means you need to have a base zone under it. So the base zone for the Monarch Cove in parcel is single family R1 zone with a visitors serving overlay. In the table in that, um, in that section, the table 17.28-1, the, this is showing the two maps. So the old map is on the left, the new map is on the right. The, um, within the land use or within the table for that over the overlay note 12 was added stating <coughs> under there was a note next to the single family under monarch cove that said single family dwelling that use would be allowed only if ancillary to visitor accommodating use so it's, it would only be allowed if it's essentially secondary to visitor accommodating use so that was a major change um, from what was submitted and just to, to be considered by the Planning Commission and I'd like to get direction on that tonight. Okay, any questions from Katie before we open it up to the public? Would you, would you like to come up and speak on this? Sure. <coughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, please forgive us both. We both have some sort of respiratory thing going on, so our voices aren't quite what they usually are. But I'd like to read you what I composed or what we composed today regarding our dilemma. My husband was 18 years old when his family purchased the El Salto property in Capitola. That property became a long-lasting and beloved home for himself and our family. It's been in the family for 58 years. It has much history from before that time and much history since then. It has experienced many changes, downsizing, including use. Historically, the R1 visitor serving zoning was in place until 2005 when the California Coastal Commission decided that this long standing zoning needed to be changed on the Monarch Cove Inn half of the old El Salto property to visitor serving without the R1 zoning choice. This action eliminated access to our historical use of a private residence that we previously enjoyed for many years. 
it should be noted that the other half of the El Salto, original El Salto property, dual zoning, the VS slash R1, was retained at that time and remains so to this day. Monarch Cove Inn is a small 11 room inn that is located at the very end of a residential neighborhood. Its primary source of income is that as a bed and breakfast. It makes very little money in comparison to larger revenues and the upkeep on this older large property requires continual care and maintenance. We have struggled to keep and maintain this property as there is not sufficient profit to really keep it in good order. It is truly a labor of love that continually we have to help fund. My husband and myself are both in our 70s and not always in the best of health. We intend to retire shortly with no plans to keep the inn open as a business. A business that is not self-supportive. Its size of only 11 rooms and age that requires continual maintenance and the number of employees it takes to do work that we can no longer do ourselves makes it very difficult to be financially self-supporting. Historically, our neighbors have expressed that they will not support expansion or growth at Monarch Cove as it impedes their privileges of residential use. Our streets are narrow there and do not support additional traffic. The city of Capitola and our neighbors fully support this zoning change back that makes so much sense to VS slash R1. <laughs> We're approaching the end of our lives and wish to put this zoning issue back in order for ourselves and for our children. We do not want to leave them with an underdeveloped property that is zoned solely visitor serving and one that they cannot use as a residence to just live on. We ask for your support of returning our privilege to live in the house and on the property that we've owned for 58 years. Give us back this opportunity to live in our family home and provide our children with the same privilege. We would like to ask the Coastal Commission staff just a single question. What is the reasoning by the decision to implement a zoning amendment which is unclear, ambiguous with regards to visitors serving? It clearly should be simplified. Reverting back to a very simple VS slash R1 zoning. Residential use should not be made ancillary to visitors serving. Thank, thank you very much. Mr. Paul, do you be? Okay, <laughs> sorry. Well, I hope you get Both better. <laughs> thank you very much. Anyone else wish to comment? Okay, with that, I'll bring it back to the commission for discussion. I was just curious. It, it, it's zoned R1 according to the new plan with a visitor serving overlay. How is that different than what the Blodgetts are requesting? That That is what they're requesting. They're requesting that Planning Commission not accept the new note, this that note. the note that says um, allowed only if ancillary to visitor accommodation use. But so that note was not, a, that's a new edit. From but the also note number three then goes on to state about single family development requirements on that parcel, which applies to this also. Correct, and that note means that if they were to develop this as single family, um, if they were to subdivide, create a new lot, it would have to follow the R1 standards. 
Okay, so I don't understand what the issue is then. So the issue is that with this new note, they would have to, they could have their single family home, but it has to be secondary to a visitor accommodating use. And their, their wish is not to have to do a visitor accommodating use any longer on their parcel. Would it be possible to hear from the, uh, Kevin as to the uh, thinking behind the change? Yeah, sure. Um, and I really appreciate everyone's sentiment here. And, and um, uh, we understand the issues and, and um, are sympathetic to them. I think from wh where we're coming from is this is an important visitor serving use. Um, and again, under the, the Coastal Act, under the, the law, um, these type of visitor accommodations, uh, visitor serving uses are a very high priority, particularly at a, uh, locations like this that are, uh, have, you know, views of the ocean and everything. And so, you know, but recognizing the, um, uh, you know, the, the residential, quasi-residential nature of this, we, we were trying to come up with some kind of compromise to say that, you know, there could be um, long permanent residential use there so long as the, um, it wasn't at the expense of visitor accommodation. So there could basically be both uses there. Um, and it's, you know, there could be opportunities for, <coughs> excuse me, for, um, you know, uh, other parties to, to continue to operate uh, accommodations use. So, that's the the thinking is just that we would like to um, we don't want to lose this important kind of priority use um, and we're we're open to other ways to address this issue but that's um, our our concern Mick, go ahead yeah I, I I just have a couple of concerns with that because if it's not economically feasible to operate it as a visitor serving facility how can you force them to continue? And secondly, when they did attempt to expand the visitor serving use up there, the community raised holy hell about it and it, and it didn't pass and it never will. So I, I'm curious how the Coastal Commission can force that onto someone for those two reasons. Can I add another little twist to that? And one of the reasons I recall, I remember listening to this conversation when it came up before was that there is a sensitive environmental habitat there, the monarch butterflies. So the con public concern wasn't just selfish in terms of traffic and whatnot. They were concerned about maintaining the sensitive habitat. And so that really forced the limitation to create an a vi a economically viable hotel because that would impact the environment, and p particularly the monarchs. So they were forced to keep it small and so now they're in a box because that's not profitable. And so now what do you, what do they do? You know, Kevin, can I ask, have you been to the property? And uh, I'm not trying to put you in the spot, but if you've been to the property and, and most of us who live in Capitola have been up there and I happen to live in the neighborhood and go by there frequently, but it's not like, a, it's a great view. There is a, but it's a very small component of, of the property to and, and this is my concern where the Coastal Commission impacts private ownership over something that is very, very limited. And in fact, I would put it back on the state that you are negligent in maintaining some of your own properties and the new, and the new Brighton State Park is one of them. You haven't had access for the main trail or parking for a number of years now. So how do we, how do we tell our residents in our community that they can't have private ownership that everyone else enjoys in that same community over a perception of an ocean view, which is, it's actually pretty limited ocean view uh, in return. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but this is the type of discussion I think we're gonna have to get through to get to some common ground. So maybe you can help us out there. Well, again, I think that the, the you know, the, the way we see this is that um, there's an existing visitor accommodations use, um, and this is a you know a, a long-term zoning code zoning code that establishes what uses are potentially allowable, and uh, we recognize um, the concerns, some of the issues of this specific site, which is why we're comfortable with um, allowing some type of residential, but. Um, these are important uses that we don't want to necessarily um, lose. Um, and so that's 
uh, and again, it all comes back from um, from the from the Coastal Act about what are our priorities, and um, generally speaking, private residential is is lower a lower priority use than um, bona fide visitor accommodations. So we're certainly um, we we hear loud and clear the issues, um, and we're. That was the intent of trying to find some kind of common ground. We're open to additional language on this issue, but um, I think this is a, this is uh, an important um, an, an important issue for us. So I, I want to kind of broaden the perspective here because uh, I mean I understand the Coastal Commission's mandate and totally agree with it. The the problem, and I want to tie this in with issue number ten because. The, we're talking about a few visitor serving sites or, or rooms there that are way out. I mean, I'm familiar with that area. I don't know. I've walked a lot, of, a lot of times around there, and it's way outdated and virtually obsolete. And the access is so restricted that the ability to modernize it and make it into a viable modern visitor serving uh, property it, it just isn't there. On the other hand. We have the potential for a visitor serving facility 10 or 10 times as large or so um, in the old theater site, which would accomplish the Coastal Commission. You know, and the Coastal Commission is wanting to put more and more restrictions on that one, but that's where really, if you want to facilitate people visiting the coast in Capitola, that project <coughs> has the potential for doing it in a much bigger way than trying to resuscitate some buildings uh, at Monarch Cove that uh, you know are way outdated and, and the potential just isn't there. You know, um, with Kevin suggesting that possibly, you know, they'd be willing to look at different options, an idea that just came to mind is we have a very um, specific nightly rental zone which is in our village it's not up in depot hill but i was just thinking with this property would it meet you know if they were to do r1 and if the note was different and said something along the lines of single family dwelling in combination with nightly rental use so a vacation so rental overlay on it it would almost it would have the vacation rental overlay on it so then it doesn't really impact it's not a full-blown hotel, but it would have a nightly rental, and it would be an evolution of this property. There are three structures, possibly four on the three, I believe, on, on, on the site. And so under that scenario, you know, they could do nightly rental out of either the main home or the second structure, but and have it within the nightly rental zone. So maybe that's an edit we could bring back to the Coastal Commission for review, possibly, a kind of middle ground. And, the, and there are some areas um, just to the, uh, I guess that would be the east of it, that are open areas, considered open areas where the road comes up on the backside that uh, maybe we can have a, a lo dedicated lookout area, but you're, quite honestly, you're not going to get much more of a, a view shed of the ocean from the property itself because it comes interior so um, yeah I think there's some areas to work through there but I think to tie the hands of uh, a private owners on even having this maybe as an option to have nightly um, as a vacation overlay then maybe that's an option but I, I just hate to tie our hands of private ownership and and Commissioner Newman is, is right we have a great opportunity to uh, allow in a, in a way more people to have the experience at the ocean in a way that accommodates parking in, in a controlled manner and, and uh, traffic so okay bye. So can I okay. can I explore this a little bit because I'm, I'm trying to put myself in the, in the Blodgett's position here so if the, the if this were this comment were to remain and they went ahead and retired there, say remodeled one of the houses or, or whatever, closed the business because it's not profitable. So there would be nevertheless zoned for visitor serving, but there would be no visitor serving there. Would that be 
I can see where the, the Coastal Commission would think that's a, nevertheless a good thing because then in the future, uh, if they were to sell the property or move or whatever, then the opportunity to develop that property would still exist because it would be zoned for uh, visitor serving. So I'm just wondering to what extent this note prohibits them from remodeling and building their home and just closing the visitor serving portion of it for now. I guess in that case, uh that the house would become, say that they got a, a permit to um, remodel the house while the B&B was still in operation, and then the B&B went away, I guess it'd be a legal non-conforming use. It was certified, it was... Um, would they be subject it, to fines from the Coastal Commission? Any kind of sanctions? I'm, you know, we, that's not usually how our enforcement team works, but because this would be just a, a um, again, a legal nonconformity that would be covered by the nonconforming regs, but. Because it was established as a single family originally. Right. Prior to the Coastal Act. Right. Yeah. And. So, Katie, do you have enough information from the co so Commission what, on what this? So, what I'm understanding from the. Um, what I'm picking up from our planning commission is to move forward without including this note in our revisions. We're trying um, to convince the coastal <laughs> commission <laughs> yeah. to back yeah. off on this one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And to focus on other areas. Yeah. And I think there's some options there. I think there's some areas that have already been identified that maybe allows that access for the view, but maybe doesn't impact the property owner so much. Yeah. So I will ask, um, with the idea of the nightly rental overlay expanding over this property, is that I, I do feel that it, it's almost better to go back to the Coastal Commission with, we've heard what you said and we think this is a fair middle ground, but up to you all if that's a big change is expanding the nightly rental. I mean, that sounds fair because yeah. that gives them the option. Yeah, it gives them the option to rent the home. You call it nightly rental or, or I should vacation rental. Like a vacation, vacation over vacation over late. Yeah. I, I think that's a good compromise. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe we'll do a roll call on that to see if there's sure. consensus. Commissioner Ruth? Aye. Commissioner Newman? Yes. Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Wilk? I just um, so I want to understand what, what we're voting on here. So you're saying that your recommendation is to change to delete this note, but replace it with a with a R1 with a visitor vacation overlay. Correct. Just over that one and property. That will not impact them from building their re retirement home. It will just they, allow they would, them or he, future u users to. Have, uh, Airbnb. Have, uh, well, I understood. I mean, we're not precluding them from use. Vis I thought it was visitor serving slash R. Yeah, it's visitor serving slash R1. So they can. If With the vacation they, overlay. Yeah. So, yeah. yes, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> and Chair Welch. Yes. Thank you. Good. Does that, Kevin, are we moving down the right path here? Does that help? <laughs> I hope that helps <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a long process. I got a feeling. <laughs> That's okay. good. <laughs> okay. Um, so, would you like me to skip to topic 10? Yes. Okay. Next is. Topic 10, Village Hotel and Height. So within, a lot of work was done during the general plan on the site of the future Capitola Village Hotel and defining what the um, allowed incentives would be within our incentive chapter. And one of those was additional floor area as well as additional height. And 
in the draft code, the, the maximum height of the hotel, it was written, um, remains below the elevation of the bluff behind the hotel, so that it would have to be lower than the bluff behind the hotel. The uh, Coastal Commission edits include adding new language, so the maximum height of the hotel, including all rooftop architectural elements such as chimneys, cupolas, etc., and all mechanical apertures such as elevator shifts, HVAC units, etc., remain at least 10 feet below the top elevation of the bluff behind the hotel. Um, in reviewing this, that for, I'll go over the first section first. Um, creating a number to measure the, the limit of the hotel, I think is a good place for us, a good direction for us to go in, um, rather than to, to just make sure that the top of the bluff is still visible from certain feast um, viewpoints. So to to identify that number, I think that's something the Planning Commission needs to think through, if 10 feet's the correct number or not. Um, and then the language also was amended that the bluff behind the hotel remain visible from, and originally it just said the Capitola Wharf, and they've added Cliff Drive. Um, so it would say from Cliff Drive and Capitola Wharf as a green edge above the visible top of the hotel with existing mature trees maintained on site. So this really aligns with our general plan. I wanted to take some, I went out today and took some pictures. If we're going to say from Cliff Drive, we should say where on Cliff Drive. <laughs> so this is from the southern parking lot of Cliff Drive. I, I don't think that's a bad place to s set. It's actually um, within the land use plan. It's identified as one of our vista points and our viewpoints. So I thought that would, if we define it, that would be a good addition to the code. Um, and then we should discuss the 10 feet. And then also here's a picture um, of the site. It was early morning, so it was really shadowed. So not a great photo, but so there, the considerations are for 10 feet below the top elevation of the bluff. And that concludes my presentation on that. Do we know what the level of that house is there in, on El Camino Medio, how far that is below the bluff? Just for I reference. Don't. Well, it's a it's about mid a little above midway of the stairs, so it's it's a good fifteen twenty feet below, I believe. I do believe we have public comment on this one. Yes, we'll uh, open up for Jesse when you come up and. Um, good evening, uh, Jesse Bristow from Swanson Builders, um, development project manager uh, for Swanson. Uh, we did provide comment today from our senior VP, Jesse Nickel, just to express our concerns. Uh, certainly understand the preservation of, of the viewpoints of the bluff. Originally, we've planned, um, so directly behind us, that bluff is at 63 feet um, from our rough concept uh, conceptual design. And I think currently, with the four floors that we're looking at, it's about 56 or 58 feet so there is some wiggle room there it's just the the one note that we expressed um, not allowing any mechanical equipment so you, by law we have to have an elevator shaft so that shaft has to sit above the roof line um, and that would essentially eliminate an entire floor and you know as the Coastal Commission is asking for a visitor serving use uh, you know, it is a low density hotel, obviously higher density for, for the village, but um, you, that would be the top floor. You're looking at 10 suites, essentially, with the way we've laid it out. That's 10 suites you're losing at a premium rate, probably 75% uh, occupancy rate. A rough number, you're, you're losing about $125,000 in transit occupancy tax that could go towards city funding, city services, and um, as noted in, in, that, in the letter, the cumulative impacts of those people spending dollars and walking around in Capitola. Um, certainly understand the 10 feet. We think that's reasonable. If it was smaller, that'd be great. Um, I believe the, the home right next to the, the gray building probably goes a little bit higher. The chimney stack is probably five feet below the, below the buff. And with mechanical equipment, with those architecture features, 
obviously we can create some type of screening that would be appropriate and in, in keeping with the character of Capitola, um, you know, just not so there's a huge elevator shaft sticking out of the roof, obviously, we want to be um, sensitive to that. So we're, we're essentially asking that um, if it is going to be 10 feet, we just allow for a me mechanical equipment and we can, we can screen that if you want to codify that it be screened, that's understandable. Um, the second note that we brought up is that it specifically asks for the, uh, the village to have a story or the village hotel to have a story poll. Um, and it it's specifically targets that use. Uh, no other development, from my understanding, is required to have story poles. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, please. You're wrong, so, but that's okay. Go ahead. Am I wrong? <laughs> okay. So, um, again, we feel that there's more modern tools to, to 3D screening, sketch up. There's all types of methods that we can show to identify the massing. Really feel that um, having sticks with red flags over them just doesn't really show the vision of what we're trying to do and what we're trying to capture with the community, with the city, and, and what the Coast Commission wants as far as a visitor serving use. So we're, we're asking uh, those two items be adjusted. Thanks, Jesse. Any questions for? Yeah. The city has eliminated the AR overlay in this new zoning ordinance, haven't they? Yes. Yeah, unfortunately, because that's a perfect application for this site. So <laughs> how does the, our new story poll uh, provision, was that um, available when this uh, was added? Um, so under the design permit criteria, so this would be under chapter 120, it's page 120-3. Under enhanced visualization, it says the city may re the city may require enhanced project visualization materials, including 3D renderings, photo simulations, physical models, expanded streetscape diagrams, viewpoint analysis, and story poles um, when any of the following. And then it further specifies that story poles can only be required upon request of the Planning Commission, and that was the outcome of that recent uh, application. So there, there is, we do have the ability to request story polls. The ARC and Site Committee does not. It really has to come from our Planning Commission. Okay. Um, and, and that was built in, I think, because with the, with the additional floor area ratio and the incentivized plan. There was a was lot of uh, discussion about the merits and uh, uh, problems or uh, burden of story polls. And so we decided, and I don't know if the Coastal Commission would be happy with this, that it, it's, a, it's a Planning Commission discretionary uh, application by application decision. And rather than may mandate it for, for a specific property. So um, that, the, the only clarification that the Coastal Commission wrote in there was the spelling of the theater site. The story poll regulation was in, in the code that we provided to the Coastal Commission. So I think that request is um, from Swenson Builders that um, under its section, it's page 88-4, mm -hmm. and it's section mm -hmm. C. It says theater site story polls prior to the to city action on a proposed hotel on the former Capitola Theater site. The applicant shall install poles and flagging on the site to demonstrate height and mass of the proposed project. It's there. Yeah. Any more questions for Jesse? Go sit down. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, Jesse. So we had some discussion, and I don't know when this was put in the, when we originally were reviewing the hotel site, I guess, because recently we had questions about the story poll, and I think we decided, that's what is mentioned later in the code, that at our discretion. So is that something we can apply to this as well and remove this and, and leave it as um, to match what we have in our code on the back side on the 120, was it three? You could change the shell to a may. Okay. Yeah. And build in at the planning, or planning at the discretion of planning commission and city consistent. council. It would be consistent with the yes. Any other discussion with what Jesse had to say? Yeah, I think 
uh, about the heights of the chimney? Yeah, I have a, a discussion on that, and then I have a point that hasn't been raised yet okay. also in the edits on this one. Is that okay? Yeah, jump in there. So, I mean, it's a balancing in terms of coastal uh, um, issues here and benefits. And we don't want to make this uh, project infeasible for what I consider to be a relatively um, minor additional view of the hillside in terms of just the um, uh, mechanical equipment that they're talking about. So I, I, that's overkill to me. And if it, uh, if it ends up making the project infeasible, it would mean that uh, a lot of benefits of having a visitor serving hotel in Capitola would be defeated by the fact that we want to screen the uh, elevator shaft. Uh, so I, I, I think it's, uh, it's kind of shooting uh, ourselves in the foot from a coastal um, uh, policy standpoint. You know, I'll, the other comment I wanted to make, which no one has, which hasn't been raised, is on page 88-5 under findings B4 regarding parking. And Kevin, let me just say that the, the, the theater site was um, the subject. I, I chaired the general plan uh, advisory commission for four years and then was involved as a planning commissioner in the development of the general plan and the zoning ordinance. And th this uh, site has been the subject of a tremendous amount of uh, input from the community from the planning commissioners, from the city council, from the staff, and uh, we're balancing a lot of factors here. So it's kind of, you know, a little bit um, difficult to get la kind of, not last minute, but Coastal Commission coming in at this stage of the game and saying, and what I'm talking about is B4 where it says that parking for the hotel is provided in a way that minimizes vehicle traffic in the village, great strengthens the village as a pedestrian oriented destination, great. And then the Coastal Commission added and protects and enhances public parking options. So, I mean, this is another addition to the hotel project where the Coastal Commission could say, uh, you're not gonna, we're, we're gonna turn down your project because you not only, you have a fine hotel and all, but you haven't enhanced parking options in Capitola Village. I mean. That just seems to me like it's kind of out of nowhere. I mean, they, the hotel needs to deal with the parking generated by the hotel in a way that makes sense. I don't know what that is at this time. But I don't think in building a hotel, they have to also go out and find a new parking lot for the rest of Capitola Village. So uh, I would like to know what the uh, thinking is behind that addition too. Sure. No, I, uh, obviously, parking in Capitola Village is a um, complicated issue, or there's lots of issues associated with it. Uh, the intent here was just simply that there's currently parking there, and we want to make sure that we're, um, you know, if there's a loss of, of public parking, that it's provided in some capacity somewhere else. There, there's, it, it's not trying to be specific about how to necessarily mitigate or to address parking impacts, but rather these are certain performance standards that we think is important for um, the, you know, the city to think about when so it's addressing parking issues there. Would you be okay if that just said and protects public parking options rather than enhances? That's the part I'm, uh, I'm objecting to because it suggests that in building a hotel you also have to go out and solve some of Capitola's parking problems. Would that, is that workable for the, from your standpoint? I, I don't know if I want to necessarily give any definitive answers today, um, but it's, uh, I hear what you're saying and um, you have the discretion to make that change. <laughs> so, so can I add maybe some more information to that based on my recollection? Uh, when we created our new parking lot, um, my understanding, and you guys can correct me, but my understanding was there was an assumption that 50 of those spaces were to be dedicated into this new hotel should it ever be uh, implemented. So the notion of parking and the hotel has been, has, has been in the public eye for a long time. 
So I, I think we've, we've already kind of addressed that and, and really con concerned ourselves with that issue and have proactively done some things uh, to provide for that hotel. Commissioner Wilk, I'll um, just relay that there is, we do have an in-lieu program and a policy at, in the city of Capitola and there are extra spaces that were created when we created the lower lot. I apologize, I don't have that number offhand to confirm or deny 50. I, I don't think it's 50, but it's close to that number. Um, and that program is set up and it's specific to a future uh, hotel in the village so, so but, that's but for consideration yeah so it would be good to gather whether or not the Planning Commission also would like if there's consensus to remove and enhance on that line four. those in favor you want to just Almost. give an indication okay okay thank you I think we're good yeah. so can, can we go back to the height to thing height? No. yes go so I'm uh, curious <coughs> as to why the Coastal Commission is concerned about a view inland. So the bluff, a view of the bluff is a view of some houses on the top of a, of, of a landing. I'm not sure why that's a Coastal Commission concern or anybody's concern really. Uh, the, I would think that from, maybe it was not Cliff Drive, but from Cliff Avenue. So if you're on top of the bluff, you wanna be able to look over the hotel and have an ocean view and not or and see the wharf and not have your view obstructed exactly but from cliff drive wow. is like you why you're not even looking at the ocean you're not looking at a natural cliff you're looking at already developed houses so i'm not sure why you have that that 10 foot requirement why the coastal commission would be concerned about that Uh, one of our primary mandates is the protection of views to and along the ocean and scenic coastal areas. So it's not just uh, view, blue water views, which absolutely are, you know, probably our, our biggest priority, but it's also, um, you know, scenic coastal areas and so, you know, scenic overviews. And certainly, you know, I was just driving in here this, this evening and the, the view from Cliff Drive overlooking all of Capitola Village is is great is spectacular and having that definitive edge of natural landform and where the bluff is um and katie hit the uh, you know uh, hit, uh, the intent behind the 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 edit here is just simply to have a numeric standard um so it's it's just building upon what the current standard says about how protecting that green edge and just saying a more specific quantitative what that actually means can we go back to the picture you took from cliff drive so it's hard to see from here, but what you're looking at where the hotel is, is it's currently where you're seeing are treetops. You're not seeing a, a cliff edge, right? So the, 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 the new hotel wouldn't block that. It would, blo it would cover the area of the trees, if I'm not mistaken. So you're really not losing any view shed that I can see by putting a hotel there. The, the view would be f looking down from Grand Avenue. Right. Into the, I think that was the concern. So not so much, I think the concern from Capitola was the, that it, that was chosen, that you'd still be able to see that green edge above the roof so that we knew where the height, the maximum height would be as viewed from afar. Um, so I think that's where the language came from, from the Capitola staff. I think from the Coastal Commission, it's, one of the viewpoints is when you're standing above it, looking out into the village, and as Kevin pointed out, it's not only of the the water, but also of the. Village so I guess itself. I'm confused. If we're are we if we're talking about Grand Avenue, looking so you can look down in the village, not from here, but from the bluff, I can understand that. But the view from here, looking into the village, uh, I don't see how the hotel is going to interfere with the sight line of the cliff or I was I was just wondering maybe that that you were referring the inadvertently to Cliff Avenue instead of Cliff Drive <laughs> makes more sense it doesn't does, it yeah. uh, maybe that's a typo even and and Kevin you, this these are the 
some of the biggest concerns of our community is the, the height of this hotel and the parking of the hotel. I think they're probably gonna go beyond your, your concerns in here. And I think tying a number to it, um, one thing we've done in the village area on height is we, we have a height limit on um, our buildings that we have in there. But one thing that we allow is a percentage of things above that roof line for specifically what they're asking for chimneys or uh, in this case where the elevator shaft is gonna rise above it. So I think I would like to see it consistent with the rest of our um, code that allows for a certain percentage above recognizing that the the hotel is going to be below the bluff but some items and I, I, do you know what the percentage is I think it's, it's a small percentage that allows chimneys to be above that uh, height but I think chimneys are specifically mentioned I can't remember I want to say eight feet we have a standard for oh you mean from the building code sorry I don't know the number well, no, I think we put in something in our code about um, height in the village. We allow things to be above that height, such as chimneys, or in this case, an elevator shaft to allow for that, um, you know, the structure to be there while keeping the roof line below the, the height of the bluff. So <coughs> we did that for Harbor Lights remodel. Right. That was shaft. another one we did. But yeah. So I think. I think we're on track. I think this is something maybe that I don't know where we, which way we move with this. I personally, I think we ought to take out the the numeric part and allow for to be consistent with our code the percentage of items that protrude above the roof for chimneys or in this case an elevator shaft. That would be my desire, but we'll see what the rest of the commission thinks. Are we reducing the height by 10 feet by this change? I, I you know, I now I'm getting confused. Okay, so the from from the top from the street, there would you would have to measure 10 feet down from the highest point on the street, 10 feet down with this change. So before it was, you know, you'd have to be able to. Um, it says the bluff behind the hotel remains visible from before the standard was Capitola Wharf as a green edge above the visible top of the hotel. We are reducing it 10 feet. So you're reducing it 10 feet because a green edge could probably be achieved at five feet. Right. So um, <coughs> it, it does though, um, having a number in there, if it were five feet, it does give the builder a little more confidence in how, how much that green edge has to be because if if a developer came in where it's not defined with feet it's a little well and i think the 10 feet is inconsistent with the rest of the structures mm -hmm. along that bluff line so it it would be unfair i think to hold them when in fact they're going to be contributing to the the view through the rest of the that whole inlet of the uh the wharf and stuff so well i think the chairman has a good point that uh when an application actually comes forward, there's gonna be so much public discussion of this issue <coughs> by people who are specifically interested in it that the, the, the result is gonna be something that is gonna be acceptable probably at that point. Uh, in, it's better to leave it the way we have it rather than to try to build in more specific controls now before we actually have an application. I like to see the application because I don't know, I mean, does this mean we lose a story or does it not mean we lose a story? I, um, so uh, as it stands now, we are conceptually, I'm not sure if you've seen it, Katie, but um, we're essentially doing a two story, so it's in keeping with the salsa ice cream, and then steps back into the hill so conceptually, if you're on the beach looking at the Venetian and then all the way back to the Harbor Lights um, Hotel, that would be the, the massing of the step back. Not exact, of course, but um, so the closest point to the bluff would be the highest point, you know, a, a row of rooms. And um, I believe we kind of have a, um, 
but how high from Open the top? Quarter. So we, we measured the, the bluff at 63 or 63 and a half, and then uh, I believe our floor stops at 56 or 58. Um, there's some room for the shaft in between there. I don't have the plans on me. Um, I believe our the roof line hits at about eight feet below the bluff, the bluff, and between that eight feet would be the elevator shaft. That would be our highest or largest piece of equipment. Um, any anything else would be smaller and easier to screen. So, I guess if we're looking at intent, the intent is to preserve <clears throat> that that ridge line, the bluff line, while allowing that view shed from Grand Avenue. And I, I think they, I think. Uh, Swinton Builders understands that. I know our community is going to enforce that. And so if that meets the intent, maybe we could just take that back to um, the Coastal Commission that we understand their intent and we have the same, we share the same concern. Um, I would like to make sure that however we do it, we, <coughs> we allow for the elevator shaft a certain percentage that's consistent with the rest of our roofline code in, in the village. I think we should leave it the way it is and wait for the application. I think we're just we're over. You mean with with the comments or without the coastal commission with, comments? Without the coastal commission changes, I think we're micromanaging a project that we can't even see the specifics of yet. Yeah, let them submit a design and yeah. we'll review it. it and the coastal commission has a yeah. they have a place at the seat there. They have a seat at that yeah. review also. So I agree with you there. I think it incentivizes. Um, Swenson to come up with some really great renderings to show us exactly how it's going to interact with the landscape and the overall plan, how it integrates in the village. Is that uh, enough consensus for you? That you is. My, my concern <coughs> is that, um, that we've heard from Swenson that the 10 feet would work. When I did the math, though, it seems like it doesn't quite work. It's yeah. Yeah, he's but, but so maybe if it were. No, our, so that our original right? plan. Sorry. I, that, that's because I heard 63 feet with a 58 feet, so that's five feet. That right. Yeah, I mean, our current plan without without comments obviously works. So without comments from Coastal, the bluff is 63. We're five feet down at 58, and maybe that's where the elevator shaft is. I have to I have to look okay. look at the plans, but. Um, five feet would work if you want to put a, a number to it. The 10, we, we would probably have to shrink our retail frontage. You know, we, we, the idea is to have higher retail frontage, at, you know, maybe 12 feet or something like that, or 15 feet, but that would have to drop. We'd adjust our floors, because I think we're looking at maybe like nine or 10 foot floors. Have to look at the plan. It's very rough uh, conceptual. So um, we, we can make it work. It's just the, the mechanical equipment, uh, is a challenge by completely eliminating that because we're going to have rooftop equipment for, for a restaurant. Um, it'd be easier with the, the number five, but um, I'll leave it to your, your guys' so, discretion. So my only concern was that this would get held up for more time so they wouldn't be able to submit an application if we didn't m massage this language a little bit and maybe go to the five feet it's instead of the ten. But I we're building a code around a project that we yes. don't even have plans in front of us for. Okay. Uh, it, that's not the way this should work. Um, we need to see, I mean, what we had is, I think, really great, but if the Coastal Commission needs some more policy statements, it's kind of vague policy statements about what goals they're trying to accomplish here, those kinds of edits maybe would be acceptable, but to start throwing in specific numbers without plans in, in front of us, I, I just think that's not a good process. Yeah, the, the way I see this, if this number is not in there, this whatever they submit is going to be closely scrutinized by the city. It's going to be closely scrutinized mm -hmm. by the by the Coastal Commission. So it really doesn't matter if that number is mm -hmm. in there or not. Yeah. Well, except that if it's in there, then they can't. You know, they're not, not going to come in for a variance. So. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's so. clear. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. <laughs> okay. We're off to a good start here. Two done already. Okay. So <laughs> s story polls is changing to a May, and <laughs> we'll remove that edit. But I, I think that makes it consistent with our yeah our our code. So any other public issues here? Yeah, I don't. Susan, do you have something you want specifically you want to talk about? We can. We're on a roll here, so. 
Okay, very good. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, then. Okay, I guess we, we've done one and we've done 10. You want to go to two and yeah, see where I we get? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so Unless Kevin next. wants to go to a specific area. You got anything of interest? Okay. So discussion two is from page 48-5. This is encroachments in the public right-of-way. So one thing to explain is once we reference another section of code within our zoning code, it becomes part of our LCP. So we do have a, sta we have standards for um, encroachments in public right-of-ways, and that's in our streets chapters. And if we reference the street chapter in this area, then it becomes part of the LCP, and any time our public works director makes a change to chapter 12 of the Muni Code, it would also be required to go to Coastal Commission for an LCP update. So in working with the Coastal Commission, we've, I think we've found a way in which to accomplish their goals of making sure that access and views are maintained from right-of-ways um, without involving, bringing in another chapter into the LCP kind of the goal here. So um, this has been one that um, in reviewing this with the coastal team, the, the first edits that were suggested to me, I, I don't, they weren't, a, there were things that um, one, one part of this was requesting that an annual fee be charged um, with revenues dedicated to public coastal access improvements for any encroachments in the public right of way. There's a lot of areas up in Depot Hill. There's 10, sec 10 feet on either side of the road that are actually right of way that we allow the residents to utilize. Just about every house. And yeah. Not only do you allow it, you, re you require them to maintain it. So I and Maintain it. So if right. there's a tree that needs to be removed out of that section, it's their responsibility to remove right. that tree. Um, so that was one that when I brought this to the uh, public works director, he worked with me on the new language and said, we're not interested in starting to take money. I understand the county does that, and it's a good program for them, but we've just got a different, um, at this point, he directed me they wouldn't be interested in collecting fees for this. But so encroachment in public right-of-ways, we actually do require a coastal development permit anytime somebody comes in for an encroachment um, that needs uh, planning commission approval. So the new language would be that they, may be allowed, but it needs to be authorized by either the Public Works or the Planning Commission. It really depends on the type of improvement, and we'd review it under the coastal uh, section of code of whether or not it meets the development standard. And then it may require a coastal development permit, and it would be reviewed under the coastal zone and the findings for a coastal development permit, but with the additional finding that an encroachment does not restrict public coastal access, does not obstruct public coastal views, and does not impact ISHA, um, which is our environmentally sensitive habitat areas, um, and that all encroachment permits are revocable, which we already practice, is all encroachment permits are revocable. So in looking at this, how do we know which public coastal access are we talking about, um, which coastal views, and uh, ISHA is defined and I'll bring up some maps. But also in l reviewing this and talking to Public Works, one thing that they would like to add to this is that this provision does not include temporary encroachment permits, which are handled administratively through the Public Works um, Department. And that's anytime you have, we do um, encroachment permits for temporary road closures and um, there's quite a few that it's a regular basis that we have somebody working on a construction pro project in which they come into public works and need a temporary encroachment permit. So we wouldn't want that to be included. Um, sorry, so I, I'll, I'm just gonna jump into the next item too so I can show you the maps of where those public okay. views are. Um, so in the land use plan, there are two maps, there are a couple maps that first identify access points through Capitola um, and... Very nice artwork, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and those are along our roads and along the Esplanade, along Park Avenue and the railroad, um, the access points, and they all still exist today. Reading through that section, um, the 
you know, the description of the openings between the buildings along the Esplanade, those, you know, the same access points are, have been preserved. In talking about views, public views that are identified, there are views along the Riverview pathway. There are views from Stockton Bridge and the um, parking lots um, up on Cliff. Capitola Wharf, there's identified views. Uh, Grand Avenue, the views we were just talking about above the hotel, and then um, from the Esplanade. So in that language about the encroachments um, in the public right, those are the views and the access points we're talking about. You didn't about. include the Prospect right. Avenue path, the path that runs in front of the houses along Prospect Avenue between the railroad tracks and the homes. You know, that wasn't on the map. Yeah, why? <laughs> yeah, I'll... Uh, you know, as an access point or for the view, for the both? Well, also for encroachment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, for encroachment. <laughs> yeah. Good point. So is, I, I guess what I'm looking for is feedback that the drafted language is okay to submit with the addition that this would not include temporary encroachment permits and that we would leave out the fee my take on this is is that it, you know, in the give and take this is one I would be willing to give, give to get some more important uh, uh, modifications from some of the coastal uh, changes what do you need? doesn't s Mick you have any input no, this doesn't seem you know the um, I don't see this no I don't think it's obtrusive you know we just had a situation um, on the public path along the river about a fence that went all the way to yeah, the yeah. and uh, so I could see those coming up over time it, you look at Depot Hill where you have like Livermore and Sacramento they go and people have their fence line all the way to the bluff that for privacy so but it's not mentioned in here so I, I think as long as we stick with that I don't really have an issue as long as we remove the annual fees and Okay. Do we have, it looks like we have consensus on that. Okay, now we'll go into topic three, and this was from fence, the fences and public views. So in the fence um, chapter, page 60-3, under, um, under G, coastal access and public views to the coast, um, the additions were Fences and or walls shall not prevent or obstruct public access to coastal shoreline, and that would be in, in compliance with the maps from the um, LCP land use plan, and also that fences and or walls shall not block, obscure, it, it originally, um, or so not block, obscure, or otherwise adversely impact significant public views. And I thought it was essential to add as identified within the LCP land use plan so that we don't have the anyone calling out new areas of coastal access or um, or public right. views because anyone's private window may seem like their public yeah, exactly. view. So just to, to identify that it's tied to the land use plan. There's support for those changes? Is that controversial as far as the Coastal Commission is concerned, or you don't, I mean, it seems. No, we, uh, we pretty emphatically do not protect private views. Yeah. And uh, so <laughs> how long before the fence comes down on Depot Hill along the pathway? <laughs> I'm looking at you, Katie. That's <laughs> no, public works. It is public <laughs> works, yeah. It's a city staff thing. It's not a, yeah, we have a fence blocking a public path now, so. We can work on that one. <laughs> Is that along Grand Avenue? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, move on. Good, yep. Oh, let me see. Uh, oh yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Are we good with that? Yes. Okay. okay. Isha, so topic four. So this is the environmentally sensitive habitat area. Um, this was uh, I think it's come a long way in, in its revisions since working with Coastal Commission staff. Actually, Kevin, do you want to do a little overview of ESHA? And 
before we are on our maps we had a very well I'll go there we this is our original map showing Isha's the the original map was the light green and the dark green areas and through our revisions and hiring a biologist to revise the maps we've brought it down to this level of these are our truly environmentally sensitive habitat areas and in working with the Coastal Commission they emphasized to me that it's really the habitat areas that they're interested in protecting and not just placing Isha over any tree in any area. It's so better defining it and then um, working when, when a parcel does ha is within the Isha that they hire a biologist to define exactly where the Isha ends and um, the setbacks begin from there. So. But really fine-tuning it, it was... Yeah, just the maps are for, you know, uh, illustrative for reference, for, for information, but then write site-specific, um, a site-specific analysis, demarking exactly where it would be um, is, is important and would dictate on the resources on the ground. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we do have a request from the Coastal Commission to remove Isha from the beaches, the beach areas, as they're not habitat area. Cool. Right, the reason... So... Um, what about crabs? We seagulls. The Eagles. reason we we <laughs> typically don't consider beaches to be um, environmentally sensitive habitat areas, under the Coastal Act, that's a very restrictive um, uh, designation. Uh, and, uh, restrictive meaning there's very few uses that can be allowed within um, such designation, and so typically we don't want to um, preclude beaches from, you know ordinary public access and recreational opportunities things and heavy use areas particularly in an area like capitola it's one thing to maybe call a very rural beach but capitola beach we wouldn't want to necessarily designate it as, as esha and then have arguments potentially in the future about certain uses not being allowed on it so leading from there um the allowable development within a sensitive habitat area is specifically listed uh limited to those uses dependent on resources, so such as low intensity public access and recreation, nature study, restoration. So that's all that would be allowed in the actual once the biologist has done the work and identifies those areas. Um, and then from there, the setbacks are established. Um, so it's interesting on our, on the SoCal Creek, on the east side you know it's heavily developed and the isha limit ends where the water ends at the um it's measured from the bank of the soquel creek and then there's a 35 foot setback on the west side of the soquel creek it's wherever the riparian corridor ends identified by a biologist and then we would do the 35 foot setback from there so in reviewing this um the 35 foot setback to the outer edge there in reviewing the land use plan actually that setback on the heavily developed east side of the lagoon used to be 25 feet and when i went back onto gis and was saying what what is this you know what is the difference between the 25 foot setback that was established in the land use plan it didn't it, since isha has been in the zoning code it's been at 35 feet in that area but 25 feet is where the majority of the homes have developed along the bank um, at the setback, and the 35 foot almost makes the majority of the homes non-conforming. So I wanted to bring that to you as planning commissioners to see if you, it's on the heavily developed side, there really isn't that much of a natural area between the river bank and the homes, and to possibly decrease the setback area on that side to 25 feet because it would make more of the homes conforming so we wouldn't be running into as many non-conforming issues on that portion this is not something i brought to coastal commission at this point because it was discovered more recently so um so the land use plan says 25 feet and it's it's specific to that side yeah so I It'd be consistent with the land use plan. It looks like, and it, and it referenced the old general plan. So I think it, that's how things were developed was with the 25 feet. So that's one change that I'd like to suggest. And then um, a second change is a waiver of a biological study 
Um, there's some discussion in there of a waiver for certain setback standards in um, ISHA for these heavily developed areas. Um, this, what I put together was the city may waive the requirement of a biological study on a developed lot if the project is proposed in a previously developed area of the lot and the project will not degrade the ISHA or habitat value. And the example of this would be, here's a property on Riverview. On the back side, you know, any, any development that would happen between, well, there, it wouldn't meet the setback requirements, so there probably wouldn't be much development on the back side of the home. But fronting Riverview Drive, if somebody wanted to put a small addition off the front and it was right within a driveway, it would seem to me that a biological study shouldn't be required. So building in an exception for when it, it doesn't make that we know that there's clearly no impacts to ESHA or biological, so. Mm -hmm. Is that a staff or a uh, planning commission decision? That would be, um, that's a good question. <laughs> we should build that in. So it could be planning commission or staff. I was well, thinking I, staff because yeah, we could make I that mean, decision before it comes to planning commission because they'd have to invest in that early. It seems like yeah. most of them would require a variance. I don't know if there's very many places to have room for but yeah you may have an area that's in there that you could add an addition I think it should be staff too because I mean I don't think it's, it's you know, we're gonna get neighbors uh, on both sides of that or I mean not much room yeah. for and addition. you could always request it when it comes to you if there's concern okay I, I have a question that um, our definition of development mm -hmm. is is something that I have a little bit of an issue with so maybe you could explain that and because it seems to me to be too um, too broad allows um, for too much room I, I like to see it maybe narrowed down a little bit okay I could put that on for the next meeting oh, agenda would that okay. work so that I can look at some options okay as very well. good um, so would you like to that concludes my um, presentation on Isha but I, I think it's at a better place now where it's much more understandable of I had one more steps. question about uh, uh, mm -hmm. which is that um, I, I initially had trouble understanding the the uh, language uses dependent on the resource are the only ones allowed and then maybe that means that like st uh, going in and studying the habitat mm -hmm. um, but is that the only kind of thing that I mean then it talks about some kind of recreational uses uh, it yeah so when I was saying about an uh, ESHA determination is a um, it's a very uh, strict once you, it's determined that you have um, ESHA on your property that's a very strict determination there's there's not very many uses that can allow on it the the resource dependent um, the, the language about only uses dependent on the resource that comes directly from the coastal act um, and uh, we've interp staff and courts and uh, precedent has interpreted over the years what exactly does that mean and it's generally speaking it's kind of those three uses um, certain public access and recreational uses paths and things like that can be allowed in it um, restoration purposes um, scientific research those are those are things so um, anyway that, that's why we don't want to call Capitola Beach for example Esha but it is a strict um, limit so if that's a term of art then I guess uh, right that is a term of art yeah uh, and so I guess it, the only concern I had with this really and I can't think of a, a specific example is where it is on private property. So now you've identified through your biological survey this new area. Now it's impacting on private property. So how do, I guess you're, you're saying that ESHA is very strict in that. And so a person has private property that now this boundary, maybe they've had, obviously, maybe the property years before ESHA came in effect. What do they have to battle to, to do any type of work on that property, private property? Or is your Isha only on public lands? No, it, it, it would be public and private. I mean, I, I don't know how many cases it, it, this would necessarily come up. Most of Capitol is already urbanized and developed, so there's already uses allowed and 
Um, so if there's a residence with, you know, on a property that abuts, say, Soquel Creek, um, you know, there, there's already a residence there, so we wouldn't consider necessarily the house to be in the habitat area. So um, th th there would still be, you know, ways to have economic uses for sure. Okay. But, but it could, for example, would it affect people putting in a stair or a boat dock to the uh, creek on their property? Po potentially. I mean, if those are allowable for even the first place, I don't, I, not off the top of my head, I don't remember that, but potentially. It would seem like those wouldn't be or uh, environmentally sensitive uses. Well, it seems like on the east side, we said that that line is right at the creek. So is that well, right? It's 25 feet. 25 feet. Oh, 25 feet. So, you know, this maybe is, uh, maybe we're missing something here. Th th that's my concern is if, if you want to improve that area there, I mean, times have changed. I grew up in that creek as a kid wandering it's like now we've identified these areas where homeowners can't even have the luxury of having a dock and enjoying the creek uh, on their own property it seems a little bit of that and that's really my concern and yeah and i don't know where this uh how far it goes to allowing them to have um input on in that or do they ever get a chance to have input just as a temporary use in the summer yeah, you grew up along there, right? Or I didn't grow up there. My wife did. Your wife did, so. Yeah. Oops. How do you? I mean, I know there's a number of docks along there already. You know, people so put this their can canoes be like in. Lake Tahoe, no more. I mean, basically, that's what this says. Well, that's what I'm saying, and if that's the case, and this ought to be, you know, people should have more input because that's one of the great things about living on the river is be able to throw your canoe or your kayak in and your stand-up paddleboard or whatever it is and enjoy the creek. So. So um, under, let me pull up the section of code, but under on page 64-3, under F, right. setback exceptions on developed lots. I gotta get my eyes to focus here now. Yeah. It's just, oh. Are you talking about the old F or the new F? Um, the new F. The new F? And you, you, you know, you can see some battles because the new state on ADUs allows a little more discretion with setbacks. So now, I guess we're going to be talking about that later, but I can see over that's going to be a, an issue. So under uh, F, it says, the city may grant an exception to the minimum setbacks in Section E, minimum setbacks, for the following project on developed lots an addition or modification to an existing single family home or an accessory structure. So I think an accessory structure would qualify for the, um, that does not extend closer to the environmentally sensitive habitat area and provided the addition or modification or accessory structure is compatible with um, and will not significantly degrade the Isha or its habitat value so i see it says compatible with the continuance of habitat and recreation activities within the environmentally sensitive habitat area so within see. that i think some you know there's some you could make it. you could make findings that if there's enough okay. room there there's right. enough room there to yeah. yeah okay very good i just have one question on, on the galeno property yep you know which one the galeno property yes is. that would be on the other side of the yeah group. now there's right. a, there's a structure in there doesn't have, I believe, the 35 foot setback, but it's in an, I'm sure that area would qualify as a Nisha area. Yeah. So, what rules apply to that other than the 35 foot setback? So, this is the, the home that's really yeah, low. West side, yeah. though. On the west side. It's on the west side between so Shadowbrook and the little park. Mm -hmm. So, that one is a developed lot. Um, it's really low. It's right by the creek on the by the Shadow Brook. So there's there's also under um, E 
there's E2 that says to allow for minimum level of development on a physically constrained lot, the city may allow a reduction to the required minimum setbacks provided a biological study des determines that the reduced setbacks does not have a significant adverse effect on ESHA or its habitat value. So I think in that scenario, we would have a biological study and whatever they're proposing, we'd have a biologist review and make sure there's no further impacts, but they're not going to comply with the 35 foot setback. No, so they, they would have a reduced setback requirement. So Is would that, that protect consistent? the, uh, right. yeah. Katie, would that also protect the bluff from development? For example, you know the house we have that was built next to Shadowbrook, mm -hmm. their tramway. Is there anything in this that would, other than environmentally sensitive guidelines and stuff, that would <coughs> prevent another house to be built stepping down that, uh, that bluff? So that home, there was a biological study that was done and the riparian corridor was identified and it does have the 35 foot setback. So if there are additional lots, I think there's a, a really, I could look at that, but I don't think there's much more room for development along beyond that to the left, but I, I can. Well, it's a, it's a steep bluff, but. It is. I don't think there's, there's no more lots there. Okay, very good. Are we? Is there um, direction on the 25 foot setback to, so that we prevent I think too many non conforming we're all in favor structures? That you, are we all in favor? I think okay. we're all in favor of that. And that's specifically on that one side in the developed area. Yes. On the east side. Yeah. Moving right along, expansion. Uh, so I'm skipping over topic seven. I have lots of slides on that if we have time, but otherwise we can s kick that off at the next meeting. Um, topic eight is expansion of the residential parking program. So the parking program we have in place has been in place um, since the coastal permit was issued for the you know the amount of uh, the roads that are identified as as um, as residential parking within the coastal zone. Um, so first I'll start broad. That within the land use plan, it's the first policy, policy 1-1 states to maintain and enhance access to the Capitola Beach, Village, and Wharf while maintaining and enhancing existing character of the, char of the Capitola Village and surrounding residential neighborhoods. So really talking about that balance between residents and um, visitor serving uses. And then it goes on to, and this is where it's talking about access and um, protect adjacent residential neighborhoods from parking intrusions while providing access to viewpoints and recreational areas. The residential parking program must include, it has specific provisions. One of those provisions is that any changes to the parking program area or conditions will require an amendment to the LCP. Oh, no, it's not supposed to be LPC, so sorry about that. Um, so in this, the Coastal Commission wanted to add reference to, we didn't have it in there, our residential parking program. So they added um, number three, which, and we've been working together at first, um, so, the original or the second revision provided by the Coastal Commission was expansions of any existing legally established residential parking programs and or new residential parking programs are highly discouraged. And um, after identifying in the land use plan exactly, I think the, the zoning code is a tool to tell people how to go through a process and it outlines the process for our public. So rather than saying highly discouraged, I think it's better to state that in the coastal zone, it requires an amendment to um, the specific coastal commission, coastal development permit, which has never been amended is my understanding from rainy today, yeah. but 387.42 and is consistent with the LCP land use plan. So it kind of outlines exactly what the process is to amend that. When these conversations come up, there's a lot of work that would have to be done to amend a residential parking program to really understand what the impacts would be to the overall public 
parking as well as the residential parking, but I think it's important to keep reference in the code of how you would go about doing that. So that's what this change is all about. Everyone. It's outlining a process. Any questions or discussion? I have a comment on the next <coughs> subparagraph four. Okay. I think that sentence is uh, too complicated. It needs to be uh, rewritten. That's coming from an attorney, so yes. it says something. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of one of these sentences that wraps around and kind of uh, strangles itself a couple times. And <laughs> so I'll just toss that out. Uh, this is more style. I'm not opposed to the substance of it. And I, I just had a little bit of a question or comment, both. Um, so since, I believe since our uh, current plan was adopted the local coast plan we've added parking lots to the city and have met the criteria of what our parking need is for the city and so as you know now we just eliminated the traffic and parking commission I guess the city council did but having been a member of that for a while we often get um, questions about the impact and, and uh, I think Katie on your first slide were identified um, 1.1 where it talks about the balance between not impacting the community, uh, maintain the enhancement of the village and surrounding residential. And what's the next slide you had there by after that one? Pro protect adjacent residential neighbors from parking intrusion. So we often get people that want to have <coughs> um, park permit parking only for their neighborhoods. And th th there, there is a balance there. And I, and I, I understand the goal of the Coastal Commission, but it, it seems like sometimes we let it impact our ability to protect our neighborhood so, because we have a huge amount of intrusion regardless of what our policy statement says right now. So, uh, and, and I, I don't really see it in here, but how do we find that as a better balance? And, and I, I called long before I was on the Planning Commission because I had this concern. I called the Coastal Commission office and I, I talked to a young lady who at what point does um, the resource, the state resource, or the beach become overutilized? In other words, you come down here on a, a warm weekend, on, a, on any, any summer day, you can't find a place to put your towel on the beach, and then we have the impact of trash and public works and everything else coming. So it seems to me we've reached a cap on, and I'm, this is TJ talking, on what we can allow for public parking here. And uh, we've reached a point where it's intruded into our neighborhoods and um, that resource becomes so overdeveloped you can't even walk down the sidewalks hardly on a, on a given weekend. So as we go move forward and we, we come up with our new uh, local coastal plan adoption, is that room for, I mean, it's gonna have to be changed because we've added parking since that since was adopted, but Where's the balance there, I guess I'm asking Kevin. Is there some point you look at and say, yeah, there's enough public parking for the resources that are in the city of Capitola? Or is it just like, no, bring on more, we need more parking? No, we're certainly um, you know, cognizant to that. Uh, and it's built into the Coastal Act about understanding overuse and trying to prevent those type of things. Um, so that's, that's definitely on our minds. We also certainly understand um, you know, trying to, to make that balance between residential neighborhoods and and public access as it pertains to um, parking and other uses. I think, generally speaking, where the, the commission has come down on um, specifically to residential parking programs, and what what we were envisioning in terms of park residential parking programs are things that um, basically programs that do only allow for residents to park on certain public streets. Um, the commission has has been pretty emphatically not supportive of those of late. So we are certainly willing and able and absolutely um, agree that certain provisions should be made to address overuse and overcrowding and, and traffic flow and, and public and private parking. Residential parking programs are not one of them. Kind of striking that balance in, in the, the commission's mind, that's too far, um, that specific uh, way to address the issue is too far swung to the, the, the residential neighborhood side. 
Yeah, I guess that's where we disagree on the balance because I, I think we uh, allow for enough public parking to take advantage of the, the, the public resources, so much so that now it impacts those, those private neighborhoods where they can't even park in front of their own house because we overutilize the resource. And, that, and that's just my perspective on it. But it's obviously an issue here and it's, it doesn't affect my house, but sitting on the traffic and parking commission, I'm so sure others could talk about that is there a TJ, at least 25 years ago, I argue that the village has a finite holding capacity right. and the beach included. And you can see how far that went. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I guess that's where I'm asking the Coastal Commission to work with us. It's like, it, maybe we should be a little more lenient if we can identify the fact that we have enough public parking for public access to the point that it overwhelms that public resource and, and allow some of these homeowners to be able to park in front of their own house and instead of having to hike and maybe move their car later. That's that's my only concern. So the, um, we will review that number four and it looks like there's consensus to move forward with the changes as requested. Um, topic nine is government signs. So uh, in updating the code, there was a very clear path on the through staff of wanting to make sure we build in the allowance for the city to be able to put up speeding speed limit signs and just typical government signs without having to have uh, planning commission sign off on it, or if it's in the coastal zone, have have it to require a coastal development permit. Um, we built this into our regulations and we did receive feedback from the Coastal Commission that they would like, if, it, if it's in the coastal zone, to have the, the statement in there, that if it's in the coastal zone, it requires a coastal, it may require a coastal development permit pursuant to 17.44. We're really writing this in so that no, we don't, you know, we don't wanna have to take all of these to our planning commission for a, a coastal permit um, and there is a, a good catch on behalf of the Coastal Commission was to add other government installed signs because there are other agencies out there that put up signs through, you know, with our approval, but for public health, safety, and general welfare. And those should also have that ability to be an administrative sign off at the City Hall rather than going before the Planning Commission and possibly uh, a coastal development permit and the expense and time that's required for that. You know, it, ju it just seems to address the installation of signs. What about the removal of signs? Because one of the things I'd like to see the city do is embark on a policy to consolidate and reduce mm -hmm. the number of signs we have. There was a time when we tried to do that, and now we're just signs proliferate everywhere. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice if we could cons consolidate, remove some of the signs, and if there was language in here also about removal that we wouldn't have to go to the Coastal Commission. So to remove a sign, there's, you can remove, you know, the city can go in and remove a sign or an individual can remove a sign from their building without any type of permit. So it is only for new signs and installation yeah. of signs. Um, but to, to that point though, if, if there is an issue there, we could talk to Public Works about, you know, that further and the city council could direct staff. Um, so in, in this, review of these changes staff's recommendation is not to accept the change and i just wanted to bring up that right after that section on the city the, the exception for the city signs and um, non-governmental signs that there is a section about signs in the coastal zone and it's very explicit referencing that if you're in the coastal zone and your you know your sign in conjunction with your development or just the sign alone needs a coastal development permit that it has to comply with chapter 17.44. And then under two, I think this is actually a really good improvement to our code that really clarifies that notwithstanding all the applicable standards in this chapter, any sign that could reduce public coastal access um, or including signs limiting public parking or restricting use of existing lateral and vertical access ways requires a coastal development permit. And that, you know, that's a great <laughs> middle ground for if the city were going to put a sign in that was going to impact 
one of the public views or coastal access, then yes, we are subject to the same regulations and would have to get a coastal development permit under that standard. And I think that's why the reference kept being put in as a catch-all phrase, but I think this does a better job and is more appropriate under number two rather than building it in under every time we say it's not required. Well, I'm surprised that the, two, the coastal staff and our staff couldn't have worked this out. It's, you know, it, I mean, it's not so much a planning commission, city council. Yeah, this is, um, I think there was preference on the side of the coastal commission to keep it in. And I said, you know, this is one that we'll probably have to debate because I'd like to okay. see it out. So if I have your support, I think the, uh, the edits will be removed and we'll submit it without those changes. But I do want to point out, I think that E2 does exactly what they're trying to achieve. So, so would this apply to the signs at Venetian Court? Which sign at Venetian Court? Uh, city sign? The new ones? Oh, the, the replace the old ones, yeah. The prohibit beach access. Yeah. I'm not aware of the signs. Oh, well, they've so. been there, what, a year? The new ones have been there at least a year. The old ones have been there for 20 or 30 years. Which is interesting because one of your, your uh, examples in another comment is talking about Using Venetian as a uh, private, uh, public right of way. So, yeah, I see. Right, it's on the gate. Yeah. yeah, each gate, each each end of Venetian court. I need to read the signs more often. <laughs> yeah. <I think. laughs> yeah. So that would have been applicable to this. Mm -hmm. If that sign went up and it came to our attention, we would bring it forth for a coastal development permit. Yep. So there's consensus on that change. It sounds like. Well, I, I'm not opposed to supporting you because uh, we have to work with you every week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I think that actually concludes my presentation for this evening, unless you'd like me to get into the accessory dwelling units, but we're about two and a half hours into this. I'm wearing out yeah, time personally. Okay. <laughs> and if good. you could send your comments, any items you'd like me to include, the sooner the better because I can prep um, and, and then we can them consolidate them maybe it's because yeah, yeah. <coughs> very good and right. Kevin thank you for coming and thank you taking the heat you. yeah thank <laughs> you <Sport. Yeah. laughs> that wasn't too painful actually <laughs> okay so um, if there's no other questions for staff then any other commissioner comments I guess I could look at my agenda we're not doing a director's report I take it no, I was going to let you know that I believe the mall may come to our next meeting, the new, the expanded owners of the mall, and um, present. It's not 100% sure, but we're hopefully looking forward to that. We'll have a shortened agenda, and we'll be able to refocus on this again. So. We should keep these uh, yep. booklets now. Keep your booklets. Yep. Good. And Kevin, are you going to be at the next meeting? Um, potentially, if oh. you want to see my face again. We do. <laughs> we, it, actually, I don't know how we could have carried on this meeting without having that dialogue. It would have been pretty difficult to have. Well, no, and I appreciate it, too. It's, it's helpful for, for us to get feedback on some of our language and, and vice versa. Um, one thing, you know, I do just want to just highlight, um, and, and, and that's why it is helpful to be here. Oftentimes we do kind of send staff to staff um, edits and, and there isn't that face or that kind of explanation about why certain edits are made. And there's certainly, there's lots of ways to do something and write something and get at the intent of what we're trying to accomplish. And so just kind of explaining that dialogue of where we're coming from, where you're coming from, I think was really helpful. So I appreciate that as well. Thank you. With that, I guess I'll adjourn our meeting till what, Feb, Mar what were we at? March 7th? March 7th at 7 p.m. All right, thank you. Well done.